so um, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session today. So after really a while, we are now back on the FCL research overture series. My name is Helen. I'm a researcher from Agripolitan Territories modules under FCL as well. Uh, a bit background about this talk series. It is intended to introduce new research topics being developed at FCL. So each seminar here is an opportunity for the team leading the research to articulate their aims and aspirations, as well as the challenges they expect to face in their research. It is also an occasion for participants to help shape the research through dialogue. So without further delay, today we have with us uh, FCL's new research module of CCD interface. Um, the speakers joining us today are Prof. Rudy Stoff. Um, he's a principal investigator of this module and also the Dean's Chair's Associate Professor from Department of Architecture, National University of Singapore. And we also have with us today, um, Prof. Peter Mola, who is also the principal investigator and the professor in Institute of Environmental Engineering, uh, ETH Zurich. Um, meanwhile, before the sharing start, um, all the audience and participants, please feel free to share your, your questions in a Zoom chat anytime during the talk, and we will have a question and dialogue sessions at the end of the sharing. So um, please join me to welcome um, Prof. Rudy and Peter. Uh, now the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Helen. I will uh, share my screen. Um, welcome everybody to this um, research overture on the CCT interface. So I'm, I'm Rudy Stoofs, um, Associate Professor at the uh, Department of Architecture at National University of Singapore. And um, I will share the presentation together with uh, Peter Molnar. And um, we will, so we will basically organize it in two parts. Uh, first part will be about uh, research currently being done in uh, Singapore. Um, entitled Scenario Planning for a Net Zero Carbon City. And then the second part will be uh, presented by Peter Molnar on a hydrological perspective on problems facing tropical coastal cities. But first, I would like to just briefly um, introduce the, the project as a whole. So the Sea City Interface Project really is uh, focused on uh, the Sea City fringes in rapidly urbanizing cities in tropical Asia, um, with a bit of a focus on um, Singapore, at least from, from this side. Um, and what's uh, important to notice is that um, we're looking at these CCD uh, fringes um, in tropical cities because that's where environmental factors play special stress, climate change um, especially, um, and also where demographic factors um, are important, population growth, as you can see from um, this um, slide. And then um, not to forget that, of course, also, um, these are also economically very important. They are logistic hubs often with an, a port and an airport. And when we are um, trying to address climate change, we shouldn't, of course, forget the, this, the economical um, situation. We can't just um, you know, try to resolve everything at the cost of the um, economy and therefore the people who um, live there. So that's a very brief um, introduction. And now I will um, continue talking about the research here in Singapore, um, where we are using scenario planning for a net zero carbon city. So the main focus is on mitigating climate impacts um, in Singapore. Um, the project, um, although of course it started officially um, some time ago, um, the real work on the Singapore side has started um, just um, last August. And um, this is the, um, the team in um, Singapore that is currently working on the project. So I'm the PI. Um, their co-PIs, Yuan Chao and Zhang Ye, are um, colleagues in the uh, Department of Architecture. We, we collaborate with um, Oscar Carichedo, um, SOG Design, uh, Mirun Borst, uh, TNO, 
and also with um, URA. I have a, a small team of um, PhD um, researchers at this moment, Abram, um, Li Xiang, Li Jiongye, and Kao Xiang, and then a number of students. These are students in a, um, a, an architecture studio, an option studio, that are, are working on um, aspects of the CC interface project this semester, as well as um, a, a number of um, thesis uh, students. Uh, some of them are both in both studios. Some of them are only in one. Um, and they're basically the results I will be showing are all from the, um, mainly from the options studio that is going on in which we have uh, final presentations in about um, two weeks. So um, just to um, be clear about it, so we're using scenario planning as um, a research methodology. Um, we are developing and generating potential urban planning and desi design scenarios at various scales, starting from the district to neighborhood estate, and maybe even up to the building um, scale. And um, we are developing, generating these, and then of course we're analyzing them in order to understand the, the qualities, the um, and, and extract knowledge from them so that we in an iterative fashion can improve upon um, these scenarios and uh, come up with some final um, scenarios that are really um, impactful for um, Singapore and potentially also for other um, cities in um, Southeast Asia. And so the idea of course is to try to create these scenarios in a parametric or rule-based way um, so that these can be adapted to various um, context uh, information and that this information then can be analyzed whether it is in GIS or other um, tools in order to um, get the, um, the feedback that is so um, important. So we are addressing climate change and um, we're looking at um, causes and effects and I will start with the um, cost of, um, of course, the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions. These are um, the, this is the emissions profile of um, Singapore expressed in um, CO2 equivalent. And um, as you can see, um, a very large part of these emissions comes from industry, whether it's a uh, primary or secondary. Unfortunately, that is, of course, very hard to, um, to work on, especially from um, our background in, in architecture and, and urban planning, um, because this is very dependent, of course, on the uh, individual industrial processes. So we are focusing um, our attention to buildings, household emissions, and uh, transport, because these are, in a way, all related to the um, planning and uh, design of the built environment. So we've uh, started by looking at carbon emissions uh, by land use. So that's basically taking the previous uh, information and projecting this onto um, Singapore by land use. But if you look at this picture, then um, because industry is so dominant in emissions, it kind of seems to show that everything else looks pretty nice and green. Um, that, of course, is just by virtue of the, um, you know, the range of values. So um, as a result, we're actually, you know, limiting ourselves and focusing specifically on the residential. And then you can see that there is a lot more variety um, dependent on the typology of uh, the buildings and its uh, and, and the urban fabric and um, other factors that um, play a role. Now, carbon emissions, of course, is something that we have is very difficult to address directly. Um, so when we look at buildings and the types of carbon. Obviously, we need to distinguish embodied carbon and operational carbon. Now, embodied carbon is, of course, the emissions from manufacturing, transportation, and installation of building materials. So that can be reduced by um, reusing building materials and components. 
but that is a topic of a different FCL global project, Circular Future Cities. So this is something that we're not addressing in um, this um, project. So instead, we're looking at um, operational carbon emissions from a building's energy consumption. And so rather than actually trying to reduce uh, carbon emissions, what we are focusing on is to reduce energy consumption. And if you look at energy consumption, household electricity consumption in uh, Singapore, electricity being the, the main um, energy consumption, uh, aside from a, a little bit of um, gas for cooking, um, these figures are not that new. They're from 2013. Um, but in any case, um, the air conditioning, so cooling um, energy consumption is the biggest part. Um, fans also play a, a small part. Um, other aspects such as water heater and refrigerators um, are also important, but are much harder um, to deal with rather than um, just improving their um, efficiency. So from the built environment aspect, of course, we're looking mainly at air conditioning and as, as, as something that we would like to um, impact or reduce. Um, obviously, the way to do that is um, people use air conditioning because it's hot outside. And this heat, um, of course, is further aggravated by the urban climate. So what we're trying to do is to impact the urban climate, to improve the urban climate. We can do this by reducing the urban heat island. Um, again, this is um, OK. This is fine in a way that you can um, change maybe the, the composition of the environment and the materials used. Um, but that might be um, very uh, relatively limited. Um, more importantly, what we can do is we can increase wind flow. Of course, what we can also do is um, increase greenery, um, et cetera. So, but here at this stage, we're focusing specifically on um, increasing wind flow. And the two factors of the built environment that we can use for that is one is um, reducing wind blockage. So if you have a row of buildings all closely aligned um, facing um, the coming uh, winds, then um, that may block a lot of wind in the sense that there will be much uh, less airflow on the um, other side. And the other aspect is skimming winds. Skimming winds has to do with the height of buildings. Um, if buildings become too close together in a uh, dense urban environment in Singapore, and they are all, all uh, more or less at the same height, which may happen because um, building heights are often uh, limited by um, uh, nearness to airport, for example, then these winds won't have the opportunity to actually go into the street canyon um, between um, buildings. And then you will have a much um, higher um, temperature, uh, much less um, comfortable environment. So these are the things that we can influence um, by with the, with the planning of the built environment. And so the first um, group of students um, really focused on that. This is a, um, an analysis of the uh, skimming wind flow um, based on uh, a comparison of um, building heights, adjacent um, building heights. And um, this is a, a general look at uh, pedestrian level um, wind flow um, resulting from this, just in order to understand um, the, the, the problems and um, the sites so that we can focus on a smaller area. So this group of um, students focused on a part of the uh, CBD, um, the central business district area. It is composed on the one hand of a, um, a relatively large number of um, heritage buildings, shop houses, low rise, two or three story um, buildings in um, rows of them. Uh, you can distinguish it as a low rise building and then um, el el everywhere else, uh, very much high rise um, buildings um, close together um, in order to uh, make, you know, best use, of course, of the space that is available. But as a result, the um, wind speed, which is here uh, simulated, 
both at the ground level, so the average ground wind speed, the um, at above the ground level by placing um, uh, basically sensor points on um, the buildings, and then also taking the average total um, wind speed. Um, it is actually um, relatively low um, in the existing um, situation. So, um, so we um, so they tried different um, patterns um, in a kind of form of optimization, um, looking at uh, different ways that they could distribute the same um, GFA. Um, the uh, the, the site is a little bit simplified in the sense that only the main roads are um, uh, kept and all the small roads are basically um, uh, omitted. Also in the idea that um, it could be maybe a more car light um, environment. So out of these different um, uh, patterns, um, two are maybe um, interesting to compare them. One is the, um, the street canyon, where all the tall buildings are basically directly facing the street, and um, behind it are um, more low-rise buildings. This is, of course, um, using the... Eh, everybody wants to have a, a, a building that impresses and is um, well um, visible. Um, but this can be compared to a more, let's say, like a centroid approach, where all the tall buildings are centralized in the larger um, sites and uh, with the smaller buildings around it. And then you can see that uh, from these um, wind speed averages, that there's quite um, a big um, difference. Um, nevertheless, the students didn't pick um, the centroid. They actually picked um, this one to continue with. They call it the corners. So there's uh, tall buildings at the corners of the sites and then um, lower rise buildings um, elsewhere. Um, it has a, a slightly, um, but only slightly lower um, total um, average total wind speed. And um, this is uh, more interesting from um, other aspects. Um, obviously, um, we want to have good um, wind flow, good urban climate, but this is, of course, not the only um, aspect that plays a role. So next, they looked at um, grid size, and they started with some um, small grid sizes, and then tried to optimize the, um, the building, um, the variation in building heights accordingly to get a, get an, uh, a good um, wind flow or average wind speed. But it actually turned out that this has the lowest average wind speed. If you compare it to a much larger grid size um, that um, has a, a, a better um, average wind speed, you can also notice, of course, that the buildings here um, tend to be um, uh, lower. Uh, obviously, this is just purely based on an optimization that takes only uh, into account certain factors. This is not a realistic um, urban plan. But that was not necessarily um, the, 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 the objective. Um, it's, of course, to extract information about um, grid sizes that could be used. Obviously, the taller the building, um, the smaller the footprint uh, should be. Um, and some of them are um, really uh, very large. But they got all this information. And they are developing um, rules um, based on this. And then, of course, they're looking further at how you know, these buildings might be um, established and also how they could be um, combined with existing um, building typology. So here's just uh, one example where you look at the, um, the shop house, uh, the heritage uh, building uh, typology and seeing how um, there could be some variations on this um, in order to um, improve the variety um, in certain areas, maybe also slightly increase the density so that um, other parts don't have to have the, um, the highest density, or even if the buildings would be tall, then maybe there can be more green space around it, which would also improve, of course, the urban climate. So this was one 
one group of students, another group looked at um, basically at road um, transport emissions. And um, so they, they um, looked at, they, they analyzed how um, emissions from transport could be um, distributed over the roads. Um, of course, in principle, this would have to do with um, a number of vehicles. In this case, it has to do more with, uh, with the capacity of the roads rather, rather than with the actual um, use of the roads, because capacity is much easier, of course, to um, get um, to, to measure and uh, get a hold on than um, actual um, road use. And then from this, they again picked uh, an area. This is an area near the East Coast in Singapore, uh, Marine Parade. And um, they were looking, they are looking at transport oriented design um, because there is a new um, MRT line that is being developed. And there will be a number of new MRT stations um, relatively close to the, um, as you can see maybe here, relatively close to the um, coast. And um, obviously, currently these MRT stations are being built. Um, they are designed, of course, um, or their location rather is designed based on um, the potential around it in terms of uh, residential or otherwise, um, but they are just placed there and um, they don't always, uh, well, they're not always capable of making the best use of everything that is surrounding in terms of points of interest, uh, for example, because of course these have not been developed um, with respect to these um, metro stations. And so they um, analyze that um, here on the right hand side, you can see um, green is um, residential buildings. Um, the lighter green is uh, public um, residential housing. Uh, darker green are condominiums, and then the bluish are um, commercial. Um, so one of the MRT stations is close to the, to the commercial, which of course already shows um, quite um, a centrality, um, but the other one is actually um, closer to the um, um, residential public housing, which is of course very useful for the people living there, um, but is not re really using all the possibilities of transport oriented design. So they looked at the, um, so they did some analysis, one of them being the um, service, uh, TOD service population using a, a modified Tucker model. They also um, analyzed all the um, POIs, the points of interest, which you can see as all the, the white um, dots. And um, so you can see the, where, it, where it is, um, uh, most central, but um, also other areas that um, could um, use, well, different areas could use different attention, of course, to improve um, transport-oriented design and accessibility and walkability in particular. So the one area around the commercial areas, um, the students are focusing on uh, creating walkable um, and recreational spaces. Um, they um, analyzed the space they have available um, and looked as to where this road, um, it's, a, it's a, in total a six lane uh, road, so three lanes in each direction. And um, obviously um, it could be on one side, it could be on the other side. And they opted to choose the option of having it split and having an island um, in the middle. Um, which they feel then will uh, require fewer um, uh, connections, um, uh, fewer um, dis disruptions, let's say, basically, of the um, um, walkable space or the islands in the middle. And then they looked also at the um, typologies or the, the functions surrounding it, um, whether it is um, commercial or residential, um, or other, and um, on the basis of this, um, also trying to identify um, where um, different um, functions could be in terms of um, recreation, greenery, um, places to sit around, um, etc. 
And then uh, the, another uh, subgroup of the students looked uh, on the other side um, where there is already a lot of residential. And so um, some um, facilities are already available, um, areas to sit around, et cetera, at the void decks of these um, public housing. But there are very few um, points of interest. And from the um, calculations uh, based on um, TLD, they found that there was um, room for the population in this area to have more um, points of interest, um, uh, a number of um, square meters, um, a substantial number of square meters. And so they were looking at um, where this could be placed. So first identifying where the, where the road, I mean, obviously the, the, because of the construction of the MRT, the road um, is currently um, not in its final position. So they had the opportunity to work with that. And then um, in this case, to see to maximize some of the spaces next to the um, uh, public housing that would allow for um, points of interest to be added um, in, 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 in various forms. Um, obviously all this work is um, ongoing work. They, um, their final presentations are in about um, two weeks. So they are um, rushing to um, get everything um, ready. Um, but um, even if their results will still be preliminary, um, the most important thing, of course, is that we will be able to analyze all these results and um, take the knowledge that the students developed or that um, the PhD researcher may be able to develop afterwards from it in a next iteration, either by the PhD students or by um, studio students um, in the next iteration in next um, year. Um, in terms of carbon, of course, what we also have to mention is uh, the potential for carbon absorption by trees, um, which of course affects both um, climate, can also affect um, walkability uh, through shading. Um, in this particular case, they just did an analysis based on a, on a grid of um, existing trees um, in, in the area to basically get an idea. Um, but this is um, of course something that they can also integrate or later um, can be added in to the analysis and the um, scenario planning. And then we're also looking at climate change effects um, in particular to um, pluvial flooding um, more um, than to um, coastal flooding, because coastal flooding is something that the Singapore government is already um, uh, working very much on, um, trying to uh, come up with um, islands and other um, barriers to um, keep um, Singapore safe from um, sea level rise. Obviously, the government is also um, taking um, lots of precautions or doing uh, uh, interventions in order to uh, reduce flooding, um, but these are uh, mostly um, technical um, solutions, um, and we feel that there is um, a lot more opportunity to um, integrate this in the urban planning um, with all kinds of um, solutions in order to reduce um, flooding. So the students did a flooding analysis, well, actually, this is a top topography analysis. As you can see, um, well, you should notice that um, these um, heights are um, rather low. So um, the white one goes uh, maybe up to um, 600 meters. But as soon as we get to the orange one, it's at most 70 meters. Singapore is um, relatively um, flat. And that, of course, also um, contributes to the flooding. And the crosses are flooding hotspots and flood prone areas that are identified um, by um, PUB, the Public Utilities Board, um, which is in uh, basically in, in charge of um, um, water management in, um, in Singapore. And um, we all, they also looked at uh, newspapers to see if there were any uh, floods in the last uh, five years that were not included in this list. Um, this was is just a, a global analysis to um, again to feed the information and and, and look at um, what side that they might uh, focus on. 
and um, the students uh, decided to focus on um, also um, uh, close to the marine parade um, area uh, at the east coast and they're using um, kangaroo and a uh, plugin for grasshopper and rhino um, in order to do um, a, a stormwater simulation. So basically using particles and gravity um, to, to, to simulate how um, water might um, collect in uh, certain areas. So at the bottom, you can see the simulation and on the right hand side, um, you can see um, where flooding um, could um, occur. Um, obviously, these are very crude and, and simple um, simulations, but these, of course, are from a, let's say, an architectural um, and, and, and a planning um, point of view. These, of course, are very useful um, because they can quickly give um, feedback. And then, of course, they can be uh, com uh, complemented with more in depth, um, more accurate. Um, runoff simulations using um, dedicated um, software. But that would be um, a bit too much for the students in the studio to use that um, directly. So then they looked at, um, OK, some what if scenarios. Let's say, what happens if we reduce all, we take away all the buildings in the flood prone area? Well, obviously, this is not going to change um, the where the water collects. It will just create um, an open space so that you could manage um, that water. Um, but it, of course, also has an impact that you lose um, quite a bit of, um, of buildings. Another one that they looked at is, OK, what happens if we um, remove some of the buildings that are on the pathway of the water um, so that that water can be better um, managed towards where it will um, collect? And um, a, a last one, um, just to see what happens is, and this is of course a completely um, different um, uh, urban fabric, uh, completely disconnected from what there is um, currently, but this was just to see what would happen if we instead built um, according to the um, contour lines, so the topographic um, lines, rather than um, according to, um, you know, a grid or um, whatever. Um, so this was just some what if scenarios. And then um, they um, looked at, they tried to come up with um, a more, um, let's say, uh, well-defined um, workflow. So the first thing they did was looking at the current situation and trying to understand, okay, where is the water collecting? And what are the pathways that the water is taking towards um, that. And so they identified basically um, various uh, four types of um, parcels. The stasis parcel is where the water uh, comes, but actually it just stays there. Um, so you only have to deal with the amount of water that is actually falling um, on that side. Then the pathways are order one and order two. Order one is um, a stronger, so more water has collected, so it's more downstream. And order two is more upstream, closer to, let's say, the source. And then the impoundment parts, uh, pounds, parcels, which is where the water is um, actually collecting. And they're trying to um, create you know, a, a, a series of different um, risk situations so that um, for each of these, they can then um, suggest a different um, intervention or um, solution. So then they looked at uh, two scenarios. One is um, drawing, I, I call it drawing together. Basically it's uh, the idea, well, can we concentrate the water in one area so that we can reduce some of the other um, flooding areas, but maybe also try to um, have the water maybe use different ways to get there um, so that we can distribute the pathways and concentrate the final um, location and in this way resolve um, some of the um, issues. And the other um, scenario is more to reduce um, the, 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 the impoundment area by actually trying to spread it uh, more, so more distributed way 
where water can be um, collected, whether uh, using bioswales or other um, solutions in um, a variety of um, locations. So they try to come up with um, ways or rules to um, achieve this. So in step one, they identify the um, SPI, so the status pathways and impoundments in the grid scale. In step two, they remove the buildings in the impoundment area. So all the buildings that could potentially be um, flooded. Um, in step three, they then use, they had earlier uh, figured out that if you have an L-shaped building or um, a collection of L-shaped buildings that, that you can use that to actually direct um, the water. So they're changing, they're rotating some of the buildings and manipulating it um, a little bit as well in order to be able to, um, to try to um, funnel the water in, in different ways. And then finally using some um, additional uh, buildings or maybe breaking up um, some existing buildings um, closer to the impoundment area in order to um, also help with that. And then on the right hand side, you can see um, the result. And um, yeah, obviously um, there are some, um, some things that they did really have effect. Um, there are some new, like this building seems to be quite a barrier. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, in the next iteration, they can conceive of how um, that uh, can be addressed as well. As I said, all this is um, work in progress and um, it's, it's uh, student work, um, but it is very um, useful to gain uh, a good understanding and to lay a foundation on which um, the research will build upon and um, generate um, further um, uh, scenarios. So we are confident that um, the next round of students will um, have access to better tools um, to better knowledge and um, we'll be able to achieve um, much more um, interesting um, results. Nevertheless, I'm very happy with the um, results uh, so far. So in the future, obviously we would like to um, have um, more um, maybe detailed and also um, some abstractions that could be um, translated parametrically, let's say, to different um, places so that we um, can potentially um, uh, propose a, um, a detailed solution, let's say, for a larger um, area in Singapore. Um, but this is um, work that will be um, developed in the next um, few, in the next two years. So with this, I will um, close my part of the um, presentation and then give the word to Peter. Thank you, Rudy. Um, can someone confirm if you see the slides properly? Yes. Okay, good. So just, I, I will be much uh, briefer. I'll try to be much briefer. My name is Peter Molnar. I'm a hydrologist and fluvial geomorphologist. I come originally, I say from Czechoslovakia because that was the country when I was born. And um, I studied there uh, civil engineering and then uh, moved to Holland, uh, to Wageningen and later to the US, to Colorado. State University, where I did my second master more in earth sciences and uh, in fluvial geomorphology, my PhD in sediment transport modeling. And I joined ETH about 20 years ago. I'm a titular professor here in fluvial systems, hydrology and fluvial systems. So I would like to give you a little bit of hydrological perspective on the problems facing tropical coastal cities and, and uh, tell you a little bit about what uh, we will do in the Sea City Interface projects. And Jovan Blagojevich, he's in the Zoom room, is my PhD student working on this topic. So as a matter of introduction, and you have heard this from Rudy already, why are coastal cities such attractors? 
uh, it's um, it's pretty obvious, but uh, we have to be aware that in this low elevation coastal zone, which is not very large, only 2% of Earth's surface as a large, disproportionately large proportion uh, or a fraction of population growing there, up to 400 million people. In fact, two thirds of megacities around Earth are partly in this zone. Uh, the why is, was mentioned by Rudy, trade, transportation, manufacturing opportunities, pleasant climate. There is a price to pay. And that is a significantly higher exposure to natural hazards and climate change. And so we have, with Jovan, formalized this in thinking of coastal tropical cities. Think of Singapore, but also of other cities in the tropics as hydroclimatic vulnerability, river flooding, pluvial flooding that was just looked at, droughts in some places urban microclimatic vulnerability and urban thermal comfort and uh, urban vegetation or lack thereof that may make these cities not very livable. There's a shoreline vulnerability, which has to do with mean sea level change and storm surges and tides. We don't have to go far to remember the tsunami in 2004 with over 200,000 deaths and of course, coastal erosion. Um, ecosystem vulnerability um, as well. There's a massive biodiversity degradation present in cities, uh, which needs to be recovered. Mangroves are often uh, lost. And of course, the marine ecosystem is also suffering often in front of these coastal cities. Uh, finally, there is a socioeconomic vulnerability because uh, every city uh, in this uh, domain has different population growth levels, economic wealth and ability to invest in protection and urban design. And there are, we have to remember this unknown effects, right? There could be things we are forgetting or we do not know about yet. And so I just want to remind you that sea level rise is often our first kind of hazard we think of in terms of coastal impacts of climate change. Uh, if we look at serious studies of IPCC. Currently, the mean sea level rise is about four millimeters per year, but it will, depending on the pathway we take in emissions, go up to about 30 or 80 centimeters by the end of the century, or mid or end of the century. But what is more important is this amplification factor. This is from the IPCC report, which you see down here can be up to a thousand times higher then the mean sea level rise because of storm surges, tides versus the still water, right? And, and this affects different parts of the globe, different uh, ocean coastal zones in different ways. And of course, different emission scenarios play in there as well. We have some platforms to estimate the sea level rise. Rudy already showed one. This is from the Coastal Climate Central platform. You see Singapore. Uh, in an extreme scenario, experiencing some inundation, but there are cities like Mumbai, Jakarta, that will be uh, much worse hit. I will add that a forgotten contributor often is local land subsidence, uh, because we have current very high resolution measurements of land subsidence, and, and in this study of 48 coastal cities that you see here, uh, which have 20% of the global population. The blue, the blue points here are showing you the velocity or the subsidence uh, rate. You see that those rates, uh, five millimeters per year, are almost equal to the mean sea level rise. So remember this, local land subsidence is actually doubling or even more the mean sea level rise effect simply because the land is subsiding, often because sediment is trapped in rivers that enter these delta, delta areas. Ho Chi Minh City, very vulnerable. In subsidence, Singapore actually doesn't show up that great. It's somewhere in the middle here with about uh, two or three millimeters per year of subsidence. Sea level rise, together with subsidence will impact groundwater levels. And so we already have ground, high groundwater levels in coastal areas, and these are likely to increase further. Um, in Singapore, the PUB and the Building and Construction Authority are measuring groundwater levels here. Some recent elaborations from our colleagues, Nistor et al. in Singapore, where you see the groundwater tables are pretty close to the surface in large parts of, of, of the island. 
So we may ask the question, as hydrologists we do, how will urban vegetation actually like this increase in water tables and the salinity that might come with that? A side note, urban vegetation plays an important energy modulating effect in cities. So if you think of net energy that has to be spent on something, um, it's either evaporation, latent heat, or sensible heat heating the surface. There could be some ground heat flux. And if you look at this globally, this is pretty clear where we have a lot of vegetation, we spend most energy on latent heat, which is a good thing. Uh, where there is not enough water, the arid areas of the world, we spend it on sensible heat and that contributes to heating uh, the air above ground. In cities, this basically means we have a city with no greenery, sensible heat, much dominates latent heat, an Amazon type forest, it would be the other way around. So here we come with a sea city interface project. Jovan will be working on the impacts of climate and climate change on urban vegetation functions in these domains that Rudy was showing you. Um, in a coastal urban area from this water perspective and plants. So we have structured our work in three parts. We are conducting, a, we call a meta-analysis of 20 tropical coastal cities, not just Singapore, but uh, others around the tropics where we estimate and rank the vulnerabilities of these places with regard to those hazards uh, that I mentioned in the beginning and identifying hotspots of change. Then we will come up with some spatial upscaling, so identifying something called urban response units to make life simpler for us to do eco-hydrological modeling of vegetation effects on, on uh, urban heat islands. And then with these modeling tools that um, have vegetation inside uh, urban canyons, uh, we, we will be checking two important things, groundwater levels, which is what I motivated before, and soil parameterizations. You have to remember places like Singapore have hardly any natural uh, forming soils. It's really engineering soils in many places and uh, buildings have deep um, um, underground um, uh, parts. And so the, the availability of groundwater is not at all a trivial thing in an urban environment. So our ultimate goal is to provide this type of inf information for urban design to the studios that Rudy was pointing to. I just want to focus on the other two with the last few slides. So these urban response units is kind of a new idea that Johan wants to work on um, to put kind of an eco-hydrological model that has water and carbon use of plants within urban canyons, but place them within uh, homogeneous units that have some similar response. This is not completely new. For instance, a recent uh, study by Mughal et al, colleagues of yours from Tsenzam in Singapore have done something similar with uh, WARF, a multi-layer urban canopy model, defining these local climate zones over Singapore and seeing how each one has a different temperature difference uh, when, when trying to extract anthropogenic heat effects. It's probably helpful to remind ourselves what does urban vegetation do for us? So through gradients in water potential from the soil through the root xylem to the leaf, uh, it is regulating transpiration, the transpiration flux. And it takes up, of course, CO2 from the atmosphere, releases oxygen and water. Um, and so it regulates and is regulated by the water content in the soil down here. If there's too low water content, this reduces transpiration at the top because we have not enough water. If the, if the water content is too high or groundwater level is continuously saturating a place, that also reduces transpiration because we have no air uh, in the soil matrix. So if, if we want plants to be effective in an urban environment, we want net energy to be spent in latent heat rather than sensible heat, we will succeed in getting the air temperatures lower. And um, then we can conclude that vegetation modulates not just temperature, but also water, carbon, and even ecosystem functions in a city. Now we're not starting from zero. Your colleagues, uh, Nike Kamaili, Simone Fattiki at NUS have recently applied this type of model and shown on a point scale, for instance, in Singapore, how the temperatures can be reduced. You see here the change in temperatures uh, with 20 or 80% vegetation within this urban canyon. Um, 
Uh, and in this project, we'll ask further, wh what are the vegetation transpiration process rates under different groundwater levels, focusing on, on limiting or not limiting the water below the root system or within the root system. Another important question will be, will future climates change the performance of urban vegetation as a temperature mitigator? There can be such a thing as lower than average precipitation in the tropics in Singapore as well. Uh, and this may impact groundwater levels, plant functions and temperature in ways which we should be able to predict. So this is the when and where in Singapore. So my message to add to what Rudy was very eloquently describing, we will build on past um, Singapore ETH Center and FCL projects to understand urban vegetation effects on the climate of Singapore, but we'll also try to upscale this knowledge to other places, answering questions such as, how will the vulnerability of tropical coastal cities be, be increased in the future if, uh, are these future changes going to compromise urban vegetation functions in temperature regulation? And will future climate change lead to other hazards and coastal problems we cannot anticipate? And ultimately, the focus in this project is on urban design. What can we do in urban design to mitigate the effects of climate change? And I will stop there and hand over to Helen. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Rudy and Peter, for this very comprehensive sharing to us regarding the um, different approaches and the, for analysis and tackling the coastal um, like development issues and also responding to um, climate change. And I I would like to open the um, session to the audience. If anyone have any burning questions at this moment. Okay, so actually to begin with, um, I, pers I personally have um, some questions myself in terms of like the coastal kind of analysis. Um, you shared to us about like the very comprehensive layers to be addressed in terms of the carbon emission, the urban heat island issues, and also the walkability, the soil qualities, and also the hydrology um, issues. And I personally, I, I have been working, I, I'm personally a landscape architect and previously I also like work um, kind of a lot in landscape development like in terms of like the coastal uh, habitat analysis and coastal development, but we don't have like very exact kind of data or models to kind of um, design and to propose a like, very kind of scientific or data referenced um, de design solutions. So we, um, so um, I'm I'm curious that do you have um, kind of like um, starting off like um, testing to kind of have some collaborators to anticipate a future who, who might be your future collaborators in terms of these uh, government policies or individual designers to kind of co-create this future yes. urban space, uh, coastal space. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, we um, are launching a um, international competition. Um, I mean, at least we're working on it to launch it in um, maybe in a month or two, um, so that we can, um, you know, get inputs from uh, practitioners, um, students elsewhere, etc. Uh, obviously, um, we are relying on you know a, a, as broad a network as possible in order to get as many ideas as possible that we can then test and see how they um, come. And of course, we're also open for any other types of um, collaborations that might be um, existing. Um, obviously, we are, um, you know, we're relying both on, on, on the scientific side, the work of Peter, um, also the work of um, our co-PI, uh, Yuan Chao on um, urban climate, et cetera, in order to inform it, but we also need ideas. Uh, there's uh, no doubt about it. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really look forward for it to kind of create impact for the like design interventions that you were, yeah. Yes, and fortunately we have um, landscape architects um, in the Department of Architecture and then US as well, and um, uh, urban planners and urban designers, et cetera. And so um, we can't uh, have everybody as a co-PI or a collaborator, uh, 
but we are reaching out and I had a, a series of uh, lectures in the studio um, by colleagues in order to inform the students, um, you know what, how do you get started, right? What are the, the rules of thumb that you might um, want to build upon, etc. And these are all architecture students. So they're trying to do urban planning, but obviously they're not urban planners. Um, they're not landscape architects. Um, so um, we're, we're simplifying everything um, in a way, but I think um, that is you know, the right approach because it can be supported computationally. Right. Yeah, and it's very interesting to find out from the sharing today that it's not the tackling the coastal issues. It's not just uh, we focus on that specific zone, but it could be a citywide or nationwide or regional wide solutions or analysis. So that cross scale kind of approach in from a small plant that you choose to use from uh, um, into the transportation system and also the urban grid patterns that both are kind of impacting the yeah, thanks a lot for sharing. And uh, we have uh, questions from one of our audience. Um, Rajan? Um, yeah, you... I can maybe address that. So the question is, how about using carbon sequestration potential of individual tree stands? In fact, that is something that we will try to do in this modeling framework uh, called Tetis and Chloris, developed by Professor Simone Fatiki in, uh, at NUS. Uh, we can actually quantify uh, this part and um, we kind of like putting a damper on expectations here a little bit because of course you sequester carbon but you also respire carbon by vegetation so um, it's also and the respiration is autotrophic and heterotrophic the heterotrophic one depends on 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 microbes in the soil which also react differently depending on the wetness condition of the soils so this is like not at all a trivial problem but it's one we intend to look into because um, even though the effect of local tree stands on actually reducing atmospheric carbon concentrations may be very low. The effects, the positive effects of those local tree stands may be um, much higher in different ways, keeping water in the landscape, cooling the surfaces, um, maybe, maybe having an effect on wind, uh, which uh, we should look into and things like that. Thank you. Okay, and meanwhile, let's see if the audience. Actually, I have another question in terms of so, um, I'm I'm it's I'm quite interested in um Prof. Rudy presented just now the wind flow analysis in relevance to the building grid pattern. Uh, I'm quite curious about the difference and impacts of some kind of uh, in inland typical scenarios and coastal typical scenarios, because uh, we know that the water has high heat capacity and the cool down and heat up is slower than the build up urban area. So the temperature difference could be the driving factors of the wind movement. So is there any um, potentials or consideration of take advantage of that kind of coastal wind movement scenarios that is unique for the coastal condition, but in then it's not easy to kind of leverage. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, the problem with Singapore is that the um, wind speed is actually quite low. Um, Singapore does not have uh, many strong winds, I mean, uh, on average, let's say, and so um, we're focusing um, at this moment on trying to increase, let's say, the airflow um, because, of course, the urban environment is reducing um, airflow through blockage and, and, and other things. Um, I don't, I mean, we, we, we do know that um, there is some, uh, I mean, there's a little bit of, um, let's say dominant uh, wind flows, but even there it is, um, it's, it's very distributed. And so it is um, very hard to um, look at such issues. Um, so yeah, we haven't taken that into account at this moment. 
I see, I see. Thank you so much. Uh, and we have a question from Lisa. Um, do you want to ask the question? Un unmute yourself and ask the question if you feel comfortable. Thank you, of course. Um, yeah. um, Peter, I, I really appreciated your presentation. I love it. Um, the holistic, systemic, uh, looking at, at uh, all the complexity of what is involved in this. Um, and so your reference to unknown factors and vulnerabilities is, is on point. And I was wondering, uh, referring to that unpredictability and that unknowability, or uh, <laughs> maybe that's not the unknown unknowns, um, what, are, what approaches do you use or do you foresee can be used to increase systems level uh, flexibility? Um, and, and I'm referring more to general resilience rather than specified resilience. Um, I was wondering if you want to comment on that, please. Yeah, this is a difficult question. I, I, this is kind of a new field for me as well. And so what we have been doing up to now, we are thinking of this vulnerability matrix. Uh, and there are the parts on the natural hazards, which we are pretty good at quantifying. We know how to do that and rank these in this meta-analysis, these 20 cities and so on. And then we have this, this uh, socioeconomic aspect, which is kind of counteracting uh, the, the hazards there. So what I mean by that is uh, you may have a place like Miami very high on the list being at high risk, but because of its economic power, it has also possibilities to adapt. While Mum for Mumbai, that will not be the case. So. We are actually just in the process with Jovan of thinking how to combine these things. And that's not even speaking of these unknowns, uh, which would probably show up as some sort of uncertainty, uh, which uh, I don't know if is correlated or not correlated with any of the other external drivers. I, I ha don't have a good question, a good answer for your question. I, if this is something you are working on, I would love it if you would get in touch with our, our team and, and, and we can work on this together. Thank you. Um, I do want to take you up on that offer. And just to comment on what I've just heard from you, um, in the past, our assumption has been that in areas where people have more access to resources, they uh, have a better coping capacity to the effect of disaster and or, or dealing with vulnerability. However, um, it, COVID showed that it is more complex than that because the countries that we assumed would be very capable of dealing with a pandemic response because of the policies they've employed the access to resources was not the defining factor on the effectiveness of their response so yeah this inter intertwinedness of complex systems is very fascinating um, and it's not at all obvious <laughs> yeah I, I completely agree with you on that one Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and thank you, Peter. So uh, we are actually running a little bit behind the time. Uh, so um, may I ask um, if there is any further questions for our um, speakers today? Okay. So um, I think I can speak for Rudy too to say that we are happy to receive any uh, questions by email and and uh, and and create a discussion. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Please, um, all the audience, feel free to contact both of them, and we really look forward to the next development of all the kind of um, findings and also the an analysis of the coastal scenarios because it's really a very important topics because we face so many extreme like weather conditions nowadays and people are suffering like because of this um and i believe it will bring quite important global benefit like even in much bigger scale so i thank you so much for um your time of like sharing with us your research and um thanks for all the audience for participating and i guess that calls the end of our session today um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Helen. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.